Hi, my name is Ali Shersavar from Breacher Digital. In this video, we're going to talk about why we need input capacitance and what types are most suitable. And in another video, we're going to talk about exactly how we calculate the size of these capacitors. When we're talking about our input capacitors, uh, broadly speaking, we're trying to achieve two things energy storage and noise reduction or ripple reduction. Um, and we need different types of capacitors for these two jobs. Um, for energy storage, um, if you imagine you've got a power supply and you give it a massive load of step, the energy that you're taking has to come from somewhere. And if you don't have enough input capacitance, what will happen is that the output will dip. So if you, well, let's say I give a load step and if you have got too little input capacitance, actually the line input, the input voltage will dip and it would look like, like this. Um, also, when we come to uh, have a brownout or if the input voltage goes in for whatever reason, if you don't have enough input capacitance, the line will dip and you want to, as a bare minimum, store enough energy so that if the line disappears for a little while, I mean, that's your, let's say, DC bus, um, at that point, the voltage does not fall below a certain level so that you shut down gracefully. So that these are the two jobs that the energy storage part of uh, our input capacitance fulfills. And usually we use big electrolytic capacitors for this. We're gonna talk about this later in a different video, but we use big electrolytics because events such as load a step or line going down are quite slow. And electrolytic capacitors are good at storing big amounts of energy for this purpose, but they're not very good at reducing noise and high, high frequencies. Then we have the second job, uh, which is uh, noise reduction and ripple reduction. Uh, if you consider the input current of a power supply, it typically will look something like uh, this. You have a rise time, then it ramps up when you have a fall time, and then you go again and you turn it back on again, you have a rise time, a ramp, and a fall time. So from there to there is extremely fast and we call that T rise. And from there to there is still fast. Uh, uh, we call that T on, that's the on period. That's the off period, that's T R. And that's T F for T4. Now, let's say if you're running at 200 kilohertz, this from there to there is five microseconds. And for MOSFETs, this is typically around 30 nanoseconds. And electrolytics are not that great at removing this, uh, this, this sort of high frequency events. They're much better at a lower step, which may take, let's say, tens of milliseconds or a hundred of milliseconds. Now, if I were to, to plot at the same time, here is my time, my input voltage, if, the, if I had little capacitance, the input voltage would not be flat, which is what I really ideally would like. You can see that at this point here, you are, when the switch is, um, let's say this is the current, the switch is on, you'll, you'll see that my input voltage is gonna fall below a certain level. And when I turn off the switch, then my DC bus is gonna charge my input capacitors, and therefore it's going to go up. At this point, it's gonna go down again, and, and, and you can immediately see that there is going to be some ripple, because here I'm drawing energy, and here my capacitors are being filled by my main energy source. And then here I have TR and TF, T4. The DI, DT here is absolutely massive, and therefore you typically will see some noise there. Same with the T4, some noise there, some noise there, and some noise there. So we put some capacitors that are better at high frequency noise reduction, and that's usually ceramics, uh, in order to reduce this. As I said earlier on, we're going to have another video whereby we give equations on how you calculate the size of your electrolytic bulk capacitors and how you calculate the size of your ceramics. But for now, let us go to the lab and let us go and have a look at how, how much capacitance you have will impact your noise and your load response.
Okay, so here is our test setup. Uh, what I have done is that I've created a power supply whereby I can take the, the input capacitors in and out with little jumpers. Uh, it's got minimal amount of capacitance because otherwise it will blow up. Um, and we're going to do two tests. We're going to show um, how the input voltage changes if we do not have enough bulk capacitance to load steps. So I'm going to take the the, the load in and out and we'll see how it works with and without lots of electrolytics and then later on I am going to add and subtract ceramics whose job is actually ripple reduction and noise reduction as we discussed. So right now uh, I have set trigger to normal. Uh, I have got uh, uh, my load and I'm going to take the load in and out and we should be able to see it on the scope. So there we go if I take the load in and out. There we go. Already you can see that the scope is triggering as I take my load in and out. The, the um, yellow trace uh, is the input voltage but it's set to AC coupling as the input voltage for this particular power supply is 12 volts so that 12 volts has been subtracted out and we are only seeing the load step on the input line. Um, and the red trace is actually tied to load so you see when the load step happens. It's important to connect this to a listen or some other amount of, uh, of impedance because if you don't put this in the way what will happen is that the DC bus, your main power supply capacitors will actually spoil what we are actually trying to see. And that's why the listen exists here. So I'm just using it as, as some form of impedance. So now this is the type of load step that you should be getting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the load in and out and the scope should trigger as you can see. Now I have got very little amount of capacitance in terms of bulk capacitors and therefore even I'm giving it a load step and the input line voltage is changing quite a bit. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to add quite a bit of bulk capacitance to this uh, to this power supply and then I'm going to do it again and we should see that the amount of change in, of, the, of the input voltage is going to be a lot less. So I'm going to add quite a bit of bulk capacitance here and then I'm going to give it the same step and you can clearly see that that massive loader step has just disappeared off and that is because now I'm storing quite a bit of energy in these and as I give the loader step the line voltage does not drop very much. So this was the test for the energy storage part job of our input capacitors. Now we're going to look at the um, the ceramic capacitors that we use for ripple reduction. So I'm going to quickly change the setup and then we'll come back and we look at it. Okay, so now uh, we have changed the setup in order to show the high frequency uh, noise that is on the input voltage. Uh, now, at the moment, I've got all the capacitors in, uh, all the ceramics, and I'm going to remove them one by one and we're going to see how the input voltage ripple is going to change. I've in on purpose, I've made it particularly noisy. Uh, I've got very fast rising edge. The, the, uh, the yellow trace now is still the input voltage. It is AC coupled so that we can just see the noise. And the pink trace is the, um, the sense current. So this is my rise time. This is uh, my on time. This is the fall time and this is the off time. You can already see with all the capacitors in that I've got these massive spikes during the switching transition. Um, that is obviously expected because the IDT is very, very high. And uh, one of the jobs of the capacitor is to, to try and reduce that. There's a ceramic capacitor. Um, and you can also see some ripple. But as soon as I take uh, this capacitor off, you'll see a lot better. I've got these massive spikes here. Then during the on period from this, from there to there, we are taking energy out of the input capacitors and therefore the voltage of the input capacitor falls. During the off period, the, uh, my DC bus, the big power supply, is going to pour energy back into the capacitors in order to charge them and then you can see that the imp input capacitor voltage is going to rise and that's why you get this ripple during that that is caused during the on period is going to go down and during the off period it's going to go up. Then I've got my switching transition. Uh, this is rise time, you get this spike and this is the fall time, you get another spike. Uh, so uh, if I take the capacitors out one by one, we should get, there we go, even more ripple and even more ripple. <laughs> And I hope the power supply su survives this. Look at the spike now. Even more ripple with a lot of 
lot of spike. There we go. Uh, right now you can see that uh, it's actually these spikes. I don't know how much of it is real and how much it is coupling into the scope, but they're absolutely huge. Uh, and uh, that is why we put these capacitors back on. Let me put that back in before something blows up. Um, so what we demonstrated was the impact of bulk capacitance in terms of the load step and also uh, the line um, and the impact of uh, high frequency ceramics on the ripple and the spikes. Uh, there's going to be another video whereby we're going to show you equations on how you calculate the exact value of the electrolytics and the ceramics to reduce the, the, the spike and, the, and, and for energy uh, the storage. Um, and this is a type of setup that we use in our workshops in order to demonstrate this and calculate the values. I hope you have enjoyed the video and I hope to see you in one of our workshops.